Welcome to the National Museum of African American Music. One of our newest programs we'd like to also welcome you to is Bosses You Should Know. Tonight we're going to have a fireside chat between Name Ams, the National Museum of African American Music, President and CEO H. Beecher Hicks III, and yes. And Fawn Weaver, CEO of Uncle Nearest. <laughs> and Keith Weaver, Executive Vice President of Global Policy and External Affairs for Sony Pictures Entertainment. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right into the introductions because we have some dynamic folks on stage tonight. Um, starting with Fawn Weaver. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Hello. Um, Fawn Weaver has been a serial entrepreneur for more than 25 years. She's the CEO of Uncle Nearest, Inc., a company she founded in 2016. Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey is the fastest growing American whiskey brand in the United States. The best, yes, yes, yes. It's the fastest growing in U.S. history, not to correct that or anything. Okay, yes, yes, in U.S. history, yes. <laughs> The best-selling African-American founded spirit brand of all time yep. and was the most awarded winning American whiskey, including bourbon. Now that, wait, yeah. let's take a moment because I'm a Kentucky girl. 2019, 2020, 2021, oh, and now 2022. Oh. <laughs> Kentucky better bow down. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> now, <laughs> we're going to keep this excitement going. <laughs> Um, Keith Weaver <laughs> oversees all of Sony Pictures Entertainment's government relations and public policy activities globally, as, wow. <laughs> as well as the company's community affairs. He works closely with the organization's operating units and corporate staff groups to develop a legislative and regulatory agenda that supports the business strategies and initiatives of the company's motion picture, television, home entertainment, and digital entertainment divisions. Yes, thank you. He's a big dog. <laughs> Moderating tonight's fireside chat will be President and CEO of NAMAM, H. Beecher Hicks III. Mr. Hicks' professional experiences have included work in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, where he has focused on building enterprises as a consultant, banker, investor, and operating executive. Having joined NAMAM in 2010 to serve on the board prior to becoming the CEO in 2013, Mr. Hicks' experience has included serving as an investment banker at Bank of America in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he closed more than one billion in middle market transactions, and as an operating principal with Onyx Capital Ventures, where he achieved more than 25% top line growth for his portfolio companies. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he truly does understand capital and cultural capital, so I appreciate his vision here tonight. Again, please give a round of applause as we welcome all of our speakers on the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. And thank you to our guests, Fawn and Keith Weaver. So give them a hand. I'm going to ask you to do that several times tonight. <laughs> Can I scoot him closer? Yeah, He's absolutely. He's so far. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, y'all come, come, come on in. We're going to get to know come. each other. I'm going to get closer, too. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, yes, so, uh, yes, Katie did not introduce herself. So let me tell you all, that was Katie Range Briggs. She is our Director of Education and Exhibitions. Oh. She is a PhD candidate at Middle Tennessee State yes. University. Woo! 
and we are honored to have her here uh, leading our team. Many other NAMAM teammates are in the audience and somewhere around working to make this thing happen. So before you all leave tonight, be sure to thank all of them. Um, I was talking with uh, Keith and Fawn backstage, and I was telling them that we are extremely proud of what they are doing and what they have already done. What they have created in the Uncle Nearest brand and related enterprises is not just about a beverage. It is about the best of what America has been mm -hmm. and can be. Um, and it is about including African Americans in a very positive light in the narrative of what America is. And so I think all of that, along with Fawn and Keith's expertise has led to um, the growth and the emergence of this of this brand and so we are very proud of both of you and I want y'all to give them a hand a rousing <laughs> hand one more time so we are thank you. really honored really honored that you all would take the time to be with us uh, this evening so tonight one way to think about our conversation is about the idea of breaking boundaries uh, the exhibition that we have in our changing gallery tonight is called Boundless, uh, is the G fine art of George Clinton. Yeah. Um, and one way to think yeah. about uh, a boundary is defined as something that indicates the farthest limit that someone can reach. Mm. And in some cases, those limits are self-imposed, mm. but there are many cases throughout American history where boundaries were put in place to stop African Americans from moving forward. Here at NAMAM, we believe in the power of preserving and celebrating stories that break those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Through the Uncle Nearest brand, Keith and Fawn are preserving a story, and without question, they're breaking boundaries. Another way to think about our conversation tonight is one that I've heard Fawn refer to often, and that is love, honor, and respect. Yes. And this seems to me is an important foundation for the work that Keith and Fawn both do and the way they live their lives. So I'd ask you all to listen for these themes, these ideals as we talk this evening. And so, in fact, I really want to see if we can start there uh, with love, honor, and respect. And I'd ask you all to maybe give us a, a synopsis there of how that has come to be something of a mantra for you all. Mm -hmm. I think you should go first with this one. No, you don't want to ever come after me, though. Oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, bye, Felicia. <laughs> you know, love, you yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> love, honor, and respect. For when, when we came to this story, we were actually both in Singapore, and it was on the cover of the New York Times International Edition, and, and it, it read, uh, Jack Daniels embraces a secret ingredient help from a slave. And beneath the headline was this very large photo of Jack Daniel, who even though we didn't drink Jack, we, we, we knew what he looked like. It's, I think his image is pretty ubiquitous around the world. And so you have this, in, this picture that we have now really pegged to 1904. And to his immediate right is an African-American man. Everyone else in the picture is, is white. It's his leadership team. But what a lot of people missed was it wasn't just that the man to the right of Jack Daniel was black, it was that he had ceded the center position to the black man. And so looking at that and then reading the article, it was really clear that the article was loose on actual proven facts, a little bit of oral history. But even the, they had about a half of a page of this one particular person that they reference as being uh, Nearest's descendant, Claude Eady, 91 years old at the time. But if you actually read the article, they asked, or Clay Risen, who was the journalist, asked, well, you know, how are you related to Nearest? And he said, I don't know. My mama just told me I was kin. Right? And so that's how everything in the article was. It, nothing was proven. Now, I, I know Clay Risen. He's actually from Nashville, and he's become a really good friend. And he said he did what all of the journalists do when they think that there's a story that deserves to be told, but they don't have the resources or the time to actually prove the story out. They will put out there what they can to lob it up in hopes that someone else will take the ball and finish the play. And this is the first time he said in his entire career that somebody actually took the lob. 
But when we when we saw that story, immediately we knew there's something here, there's something special. Now, it was one of the top 10 New York Times stories that year. And but nobody else did anything with it except God bless them, Black Twitter. <laughs> black Twitter decided on their own, not because it was in the article, on their own, they decided that Jack Daniel was a slave owner, that he stole the recipe from his slave, that he hid the slave. It, uh, there, none of that was in the article. None of that was true. But the headlines across the country and around the world very quickly became about that. And so we're looking at this. I order a book called Jack Daniel's Legacy, his only authorized biography written in 1967, height of the civil rights era. You're talking about the most famous American whiskey maker. He's in Lynchburg, Tennessee. You have a white reporter from Tuscaloosa, Alabama that comes up to Lynchburg to tell the story. And he includes Nearest and his boys, George and Eli, by name, more times than Jack Daniel's own family. Wow. So... What was clear between him ceding the center position to the black man and his only authorized biography was that it wasn't that he was ever meant to be erased. I believe that Jack wanted to make sure Nearest would never be forgotten, and that was his way of doing it when he was alive. That, that's outstanding. Uh, Keith, what, would you add anything to that? No. <laughs> actually, actually, yes, I would. Uh, I, I, it was a bad idea for her to go first. It always it's like you don't follow yeah. Oprah or somebody like that or Beyonce. Is this what I want you to? Do. But what I would say, what inspires me about the question is really that's the history and the context of how the brand was born. Actually, even before the, our brand was born, the origin of Jack Daniel and nearest those two men and how that relationship forged a great company, and through that, and us discovering that, another great company created. But for me, what excites me most is the way our company lives and thrives today. Love, honor, and respect is a part of the ethos of the company. It's part of how all of you know us is through that. It's part of when we are in the marketplace and people respond to the brand, it's, because, it's out of love, honor, and respect. Yes, the whiskey's amazing, <laughs> award-winning multiple times. Um, but it's really that, and, and as you were talking, Henry, about sort of the fabric and the best of America, the best of who we are, it exemplifies that in terms of how we operate, how we live, and how you consume, and how you respond to us in the marketplace. So it's just really, really awesome. And so I, I love the question, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember when we first met, um, down at one of the honky tonks on Lower Broadway, and you all had a, a yes. launch party. And I remember, Fawn, when you raised a glass and oh. you toasted to Jack and, and to Nearest. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember taking note of that mm -hmm. and kind of saying, this is, this is different. This is very different. And so. I'll, te I'll tell you why I, I did that, and I still continue to toast Jack on a very regular basis, is. I interviewed, I brought all of the eldest descendants, African-American descendants of not only Nearest Green, but everyone who grew up in Lynchburg. So imagine in the kitchen banquet area of the church where Nearest's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all the way down to the current generation in AME Church in Lynchburg that they had always attended. And I just put the invitation out. If you black and you grew up in Lynchburg, <laughs> I wanna hear your story. And I was hoping that I'd get at least 20 people to walk through that door. And I actually bought, brought a film crew with me, not for the purposes of filming it to put it out to the world, but just as the basis for my research, is I wanted to tell whatever the story was that they lived. And I, I, I think we ended up with about 50 people there. Everyone was, for the most part, over the age of 75, but you had a lot of people that were over the age of 90. Mm. So they, they were here in the middle of it. And there were a, couple, a few things that stood out to me. Uh, and I try to give this whenever I have the time to lay the groundwork of what happened here, it, which usually I don't. It's usually in the press at six minutes, but when I have the time, uh, because I think it's important to understand, because I do believe that Jack Daniel was the first case of allyship that we've seen wow. in this country, and I'm going to tell you why. 
is the the people who are still alive that, and some just recently passed away, that worked for Jack's nephew, who took over the company, continued to run it as Jack did. And I asked those African Americans, uh, how many, what was the sort of population of African American workers at Jack Daniel when you were there? And understanding that in Lynchburg, Tennessee, the amount of African-American population was about 30% at that time. At Jack Daniel Distillery, which was the top employer, the employer that paid the most, where everyone was trying to get into, they tried to get their kids into, 50%. That meant he had to pull black people from outside of Lynchburg just to get right to that that number but this was the thing that was most important to me is that they said that whatever job they were in and these are people that are in their 90s right whatever job they were in if a white person came and did the same job after them the white person got paid less wow because he paid people on tenure uh. color didn't matter and so you look at, and when they began telling these stories, there's a, a, a school teacher, the person who I mentioned, Claude Eady, who was in the New York Times. I interviewed he and his wife and Miss Dot. I kept hearing her name around town. She was like everyone's fourth grade teacher. Everybody loved Miss Dot. And I said, Miss Dot, you were here during integration. You were a school teacher. I said, How, were you with me for this interview? You were, right? And I said, I said, how was that? And she paused for a second, correct me if I'm wrong. She paused for a second, and then she said, hmm, nobody's ever asked me that. And she paused another second, and she said, I guess it was a non-issue. What? You're in Lynchburg. Lynchburg. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And, 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 And so as she began to describe it, I said, I just, I don't understand this. And I had to get it all on camera because I didn't think anybody would believe me after it was all over. So I'm happy I did that. And and I said, well, explain to me how it could have been a non-issue. I saw Brown versus Board of Education. I saw the U.S. guards and everyone else. I mean, we all saw those pictures. So how could it be a non-issue right above the Alabama border? That's where Lynchburg is. Sure, right. And she said, well, I guess because the kids were playing together uh, on the weekends and after school. So they just became happy to be able to play together during the day. And so these are the stories that we don't hear about in American history when we begin talking about us, right? And I actually have a belief that if we believe our entire background was that of struggle, was that of hate, it lacked hope, that it's difficult to point to hope now. And so I like pointing back to something where it was done right in order to provide hope for today. Let the church say amen. <laughs> Keith, I, I, uh, from everything I could, I could find, you are from Los Angeles. I am, yeah. And am. Uh, so I wonder Born what was it like growing up and making your way from sweeping hair in your mom's <laughs> salon uh, to a stellar career with Sony where you run all kinds of things, real estate and... Oh, wow. I was thought about and prayed for a lot. And um, I've always had a strong, strong work ethic, so that was a good, a good flag there on the hair sweeping. Um, I've always had a side hustle or four. Okay, right. And so he hair still sweeping, does, by the way. I, it's, it's, it's funny. And so I think through that, and my father was really, really tough in ways that he would say, um, that's why you're so successful is because I was so hard on you. I have mixed feelings about that. But sell, sweeping hairs, selling fruit, washing cars, whatever to make this all work, but it was really through my mother who was just, like I said, praying for me, rooting for me, probably now still somewhere praying for me. She'll ask me, she said, hey baby, do you need a a cup of milk? I'm like, mom, I'm good, I promise you. I I got this, I can buy some milk, I can buy some milk. She still Uh, puts money in his his birthday cards. (laughs) It's hysterical, it's hysterical, but it's just a lot of favor. I mean, I didn't go to a fancy school Um, or fancy graduate school, and there were just opportunities. And the thing that I've learned the most, and what I've benefited from the most, is that people are watching 
and observing when you least expect it. And so some of my best opportunities, bless you, uh, were from people observing me in times of trial, adverse, I didn't even know. I was like in the doldrums of whatever I was doing and then someone said, hey, I saw you or you helped me. And that's what opened up the door for me to start at Sony. I've been there 21 years. Hard to believe. Yeah. I mean, to be this young. Yeah. I mean, I yes. just can't be. So, so, I do want to add a little color to him because he's incredibly I humble. Back. I know, I know. He's incredibly <laughs> humble. It, it's not that he's just been at Sony Pictures and he's an executive vice president. He's one of the highest ranking black people in the industry, period. And it, it, the, the entertainment industry is incredibly tumultuous. You just do not, you have to leave to grow and it's just, you bounce around and he has outlived five CEOs. And every sing single CEO looks to him for direction. And so there's something uh, in, enormously special. There's favor and you've taken that favor, there's no doubt about it, but you have worked your behind off and you've done something that most people haven't figured out how to do, which is to rise in the corporate ladder She's and so not cute. lose I who you are. <laughs> you guys gotta leave, you gotta leave. You gotta <laughs> <laughs> so now y'all know why we call it bosses, you should. Um, so Fawn, your father, Frank, mm -hmm. so there's, a, we are in the National Museum of African American yeah. Music. Yeah. Your father, Frank, was a Motown songwriter and, yeah. and a minister. Mm -hmm. And these are two different parts of your young life. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've spoken about um, an upbringing that was really two different worlds. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how that shaped you as a young adult yeah. kind of starting off in your career. Well, I, I grew up as a preacher's kid, right? And so even though... You know, Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, Diana Ross, those kind of people were always at the house, but they weren't there because he was doing music for them. He became the, the minister. Uh, so the background on my father is he was one of the original hit makers for Motown. And so if you go back, and, and I only know this, by the way, because of my husband, because the first time I took him to my parents' house, he walks through the door and he sees platinum and gold records everywhere. And he turns to me, he said, did you forget to tell me something? <laughs> I just never had, I'd never thought about it. Because to me, I was a preacher's kid. But he, my father was the number two producer in the nation. Wow. Which, yeah, right? Super dope, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, the song that Bruce Springsteen just released as the single off of his new album was the only song my father ever wrote, produced, and actually sang as the artist. And uh, I understand that 45 is a little tough to find. Uh, that 45 is the highest. What, what was the stat on that? It was. I think it went for the highest amount of money at auction for a 45, 45 ever, ever in ever. history. And it was Barry Gordy gave him a choice. He didn't like his he didn't like his his writers, his top writers and producers also being artists for good reason. He didn't want them on the road. Right. He wanted them in the studio. Right, right, and right. so he gave him that option. And my father chose the, the smarter option for financial purposes. Right. And and so that 45 was supposed to be gone. But I grew up as as the preacher's kid. I didn't know his disco discography until my husband literally pulled it up on Wikipedia and sent it to me and said, you need to know your father's history before <laughs> well, he was a so, pre so preacher. Just... My mic sounds nice. Here Check we go. one. I go on the date with Vaughn, and I go to her house, her parents' house, I'm like, who are these black people that live here? And then we come into the house and there are all these records and most people would be talking about my dad, my mom, whoever did this, that, the third. And she's like, oh, he's a Motown hit maker. It was very, very, you know, whatever. And then so I took to Y'all, I listen to country music <laughs> when I, I was growing up. I, I, took to, I took to Google to find out, I was like, what he produced stop in the name of love love child your, your dad wrote and produced that it's about your brother oh my gosh like this is crazy um so then i was like this is amazing and then through that she's like oh really oh i, I like that song 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Middle think, child rebel. Yeah. Preacher's, preacher's kid child. and middle child. Oh. Yeah. I left home when Pray I was 15, me. though, right? So my, my life was just everything from 15 on was was a life that I created separate and apart from my parents. And so I just, by the time I met him, this is nine years after I had left home and it just didn't, to me, he was a, he was a pastor. And, and when he passed away, he, he was, that is how people remembered him first and foremost was he was so many people's pastor. That, that is incredible. Keith, when we talked, you referred to your relationship with Fawn. You said, we are partners in all things. We are. And, um, <laughs> and that, you know, that obviously stuck with me when you said that. I really appreciated that. And uh, so, I, but I wonder how important is marital collaboration <laughs> to breaking down barriers? Yes. And how does it influence how you all uh, approach projects professionally? Oh, it influence, it, 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 it's everything. Uh, she's my best friend, my help me, my soulmate my partner in good and and everything else and and the way we win is through through all of that through that strength so together we know um we're able to tackle anything i mean it's just incredibly rich it's just um we have very different styles and sensibilities but they're always very complimentary and now it's funny because we're starting to take on each other's sensibilities so it confuses people that work with us because she's harder edge but then i'm the one that would actually fire you <laughs> i'd hug you after but then i would fire you. <laughs> uh, so it's just it's just it's it's amazing fawn the uh the happy wives club was a new york best uh, new york times best-selling book yeah. Uh, I am only halfway through reading it. I couldn't get it done before tonight. Um, but I, but it, is a, it really is a very, I can feel the journey um, that you were taking as I'm reading it. I, I won't, it just in the interest of time, um, ask you to go too much into that. But what is lesson number one that you took from that experience and from writing that book? Yeah, I, I well, there's. I, I'll answer that in two parts because I was interviewing couples. Just for those who don't know the book he's referencing, I traveled to six continents, to twelve countries, and I interviewed couples happily married twenty five years or more to deduce the common denominator. And I was looking for one. I found twelve. So when you're talking about different backgrounds, different religions, different races around the world. And it wasn't until I brought my notes back and began highlighting that I realized the same 12 things were talked about over and over and over again. And, and so the number one thing that I learned from those couples was mutual respect. Mm. There was a very popular book, I think it still is, uh, called Men Want, Lo Women Want Love, Men Want, it's called Love and Respect. And the, and the premise is, 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 is men want respect, women want love. And what was very clear when you're talking about people happily married for a quarter of a century or more, both want both. Right, okay. And, and so that was very key. Respect has always swung both ways for us. Enormous respect. There's no one who I respect more, honor more, appreciate more, adore more. I told someone last night because I'm paid for speaking engagements and I'm not cheap, but I didn't charge for this. And I said, it's a really good thing because I might just gaga goo goo over him the whole time. And that'd be <laughs> terrible if somebody paid me to do that. But the, the, the most important thing I took from it, because we were 10 years into our marriage at that time, we're about to celebrate 19 years of marriage, and we're still newlyweds. And at that time, 10 years, I'm a, a very strong person, if anyone's not picked that up. Right? <laughs> I'm a very strong-willed person, and one of my concerns as time went on is how does that work in a marriage? And what was so beautiful was as I was interviewing all these couples, one of the main common denominators is every wife was incredibly strong, hmm. incredibly strong, but she did not mind doting. She doted each time. 
they would dote over their spouse. And so there is this strength that you have when you're out in the workplace. I was talking to top plastic surgeons and judges and that kind of thing. But then you come home and that's when you get to take off your superwoman, your Wonder Woman outfit and truly be vulnerable. And so they had mastered this ability to crush people in the boardroom, but then to go home and be able to be almost childlike. Look, y'all, we at church, as far as I'm concerned. This is... <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing that. But Fawn, in addition to that, you are something of a pioneer in integrated marketing. You worked in hospitality, and you worked with G. Garvin, building restaurants, among others. Um, so there's all kinds of things that you did uh, before stumbling upon Uncle Nearest. What lessons did you learn from those experiences that you and Keith are now able to apply uh, as you build Uncle Nearest? Sure, my first company 27 years ago was a PR and special events firm. And everything that I have done, especially Uncle Nearest, has been, the foundation is, is public relations. The foundation, there is not a single brand in the world that is talked about in the press more than Uncle Nearest on any given day, any given week, whether or not we've actually said anything in the press. There, I mean, I get the press recap every week, and we'll have 20 major press hits every single week. It's been that way for six years. And it's one of the things in the industry that people haven't been able to figure out how in the world, because anyone who has a business who's tried to you know, do PR, you, you have a product, you send that out, you hope someone writes about it, but more likely than not three months later, nobody cares, no one is writing about it. And the piece that people don't know is we've never put out a press release on Uncle Nearest that I didn't write. Every wow. bit of our PR strategy, I actually lay out. And I have a PR firm hired to execute my PR strategy and vision. And so the biggest lesson that I learned is one that we're actually watching in real time with this war in Ukraine. Mm. Is you have a president who had terrible ratings, who was by trade a comedian before he got put into office. He didn't have a whole lot of respect. And then all of a sudden, this war comes knocking on his door. America does the same thing that we've done in other types of situations where we know a country is going to be demolished and we offer a safe ride. And his response to the US was, I need ammunition, not a ride. And from that moment forward, he literally has done press conferences three times a day for now, what, going on nine months? We never not see him in the press. And so you're looking at what I've done with Uncle Nears is identical to the reason why they're going to win that war. Yeah, they are. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. And, and now I want to let you brag just a little bit more. Um, now, as we said earlier, yours is the fastest growing spirit brand in the country. The in most U.S. history. In U.S. history. <laughs> And the most awarded get whiskey right. in America over that. Yeah. yeah, so tell us more about that. <laughs> Smart. <Yeah. laughs> well, the, 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 the beautiful thing is, is that we, we brought in Nearest Green's great-great-granddaughter as our, uh, to, to really oversee the Nearest Green Foundation. So before we ever sold a bottle, we began paying for all of Nearest's descendants who are of college age for full rides through college. So Give a hand for that. BAs, masters, JDs, we've had several graduate already with their undergraduate and have several graduate with their masters. And I'm trying to push somebody to go to PhD. I haven't been able to do that just yet, but I, I am trying. Uh, but my, my goal, my desire, my hope was that every major position in our company would be a green descendant. Mm. But I should have thought about that before we started putting them through school. Right. Because nobody wants to come back to Shelbyville. <laughs> They're like, we're in New York, we're in California, we're in Chicago, we're right. in, nobody wants to come back. Yeah, which is fine. I think at some point they will come back. Sure. But Victoria Edie Butler, we call her Queen V, Queen for, for y'all who know her. Y'all give, give Victoria Queen v. Edie Butler a hand. Queen V. And when we brought her in, it was the director of administration. And that was really to oversee the foundation, to finish the, the background. And then there was this, this 1884, and this comes back. Keith always laughs at me because I, marketing ideas are not something that I try to, they just 
come. And the 1884 bottle was really just this thought of, let's have every green descendant have their own batch, their own blend that they do alongside our experts, but that they come in there and their name is on the bottle, it's their signature, and they choose the barrels that they want to see in this blend. Victoria was first up. There's actually a, a, a descendant here in Nashville, Melissa, who was supposed to be number two. And Victoria went into that tasting. Keith and I were both there, and she slayed it. Halfway through, first she came and she's so nervous, and she's like, Fawn, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, just trust that whiskey is in your blood. This is generational. Right. So just do what you do, and let's see what happened. Halfway through, she was telling the people, that one's out. That one's out. This one's in. She did such a phenomenal job. We immediately put that batch out into the marketplace. It began winning gold, double gold, immediately master medals. And so I said, Victoria, can you do the second batch? We'll just, and I just kept pushing back the next person. Second batch, I didn't even bother showing up because it was so clear that she was meant to do that. And so I say all that to say that when she joined us in 2019, she had never been in the industry, never thought about the industry. Sitting here today, she is now four-time Master Blender of the Year. And when Whiskey Magazine named her back-to-back, -back, gave her that honor back-to-back, -back, it was the first time in that magazine's 26-year history that any person of any color had been named Master Blender of the Year twice. Unbelievable. And so for our company, we've got, I think we've, we're now at something like 15, maybe 20 things that we've just crushed the barrier. One of the things that um, people now know, but they didn't know when we first began for the first few years, because it wasn't a part of my PR strategy till year three, is that we have always had an all-female leadership team. Always. Every man give it up for that. in our company reports into a woman. But that wasn't intentional. I didn't realize that until the press pointed it out to me. Uh, but again, and I don't know if I shared this with you, is the other day I was literally thinking about what the diversity of our distillery looks like. Because our distillery will absolutely be one of the top three visited distilleries within the next three years, without question. And we're not that old. <laughs> we opened Juneteenth 2020. So this, you're not talking about. And so I was thinking about the, the makeup of our leadership team. And I realized that of our nine leaders, Daria is sitting here. She's one of them. She's the general manager for when we open it in March, the world's longest bar, Humble Baron. And that's, that is coming to, we're taking the, the world record, the Guinness Book of World Record. We're and taking it from story. Ohio. We're bringing, it's really cool. Uh, but I began lo looking at all of our leadership team and realized that of our 12, nine, eight are African American, one is Puerto Rican, two, they're white, LGBTQI. We have exactly one straight white male <laughs> in leadership and our company. And let me tell you, it is the best distillery in this country, hands down. Y'all give him a hand, for sure. So I'm going to ask this one last question, and then that should leave us 15 or 20 minutes for questions. So I hope we've got a couple of microphones out here um, so that if you I'm, I'm trying to stall to give you all a chance to get yourselves together to ask a few questions. Um, but I'm just really curious, what has been one of the greatest, biggest boundaries um, either self-imposed or otherwise, kind of coming back full circle, that you've had to overcome? And what steps did you take to do that? I guess I'm now um, very clear about the boundaries that you have or the ones that are self-imposed. Mm -hmm. And every boundary that we've had is just a, you know, part of your own thought, your own limitation. Some would say that the boundary would be capital. Spirits industry is very capital intensive. Um, we have not had that challenge. <laughs> Some would say penetrating the marketplace, very difficult to do with distributors, the relationships. There's not just one distributor, there's a multitude of distributors. 
we achieve that. And I think for us, because we both are aligned on this point, we don't really think about boundaries in the way, um, in that way at all. We don't really, we think boundless mm -hmm. is really what it is. And it's just a function of our own thoughts, prayer, pursuit, dream, vision, realization that allows us to grow. So all of these first, the youngest, the this, the that, the first and the only and the that, is really um, an outgrowth of that. And for me, it's more about reminders of things like that. I see other signs of that, that re reinforce the way we think and how we operate. And I think, I think something you said earlier, not focusing on that allows us to continue growing. That's why we're highly optimistic and don't really focus on that. Things that we face, sure, but it's on a continuum. It's here's this issue. We know we will hurdle this. <laughs> um, so we don't stay rooted in that circumstance because we know it's momentary. I'll, I'll add on to, to what he said because he said when talking about capital, we haven't had this challenge. So I want to clarify, it doesn't mean the challenge has not existed. It's meant we have decided we were not going to have that right. challenge. Right. It's so I just I want to clarify that other people doing what we have done probably would not have gotten through year one. So I don't want anyone to think that it has been rosy in terms of how another person would take it. I think one of the beauties of our relationship, of our partnership, is that it is rooted, it is grounded in faith. And we have seen so much happen where it just looks like, well, this is, this is the end if it's somebody else. But because it's us, we're going to pray about it, we're going to get on our, our knees about it, we're going to do, and we're not going to stress about it because the end of the matter with God is always good. So if it is not good, it's not the end of the matter. And we just subscribe to that. And so when we're, when we're talking about challenges, the reason why we absolutely believe that it is in the, the biggest challenge for most people is in their mind is because when we come up against what other people would consider an insurmountable challenge, we look at it and say, what's the setup for greater? Because if good is the end of the matter, then that means that this is a temporary setup. It's a temporary block that we just need to hurdle to get to the next level. And that's how we look at everything. Our chief business officer called me on Wednesday. I didn't even bother telling you this because it didn't really matter. And, and she said, I just need some guidance. She said, I need some guidance. And there was something that was going really wrong. And for her, it was just, I mean, it was causing anxiety. And, and she says, I'm not sleeping. And, and, and my husband is like, oh my God, you need to call Fawn. And, and she tells me the whole problem. And, and, and to other people, it would be, to probably most of the people in this room, it's a big problem. And I sat and I listened. And I said, first, I need more data. Second, I'm not concerned. And she says, I know, you're never concerned. And she's like, you got to teach me how to do this. And I said, it's because you've not worked the muscle as much as I have. When you have come into challenges like this and you have seen that it always turns out good, every single time that increases the muscle. I said, you've had things too easy. So the muscle's not been worked. The reason why I'm so calm and unbothered is because I've worked that muscle so much that I'm not bothered by what takes other people out. So, <laughs> so, so, so y'all repeat after me. God is always good. God is always, God is always good. good. So if it's not good, it's not, it's not, not, good. It's not the end of the matter. Y'all take that home with you and take it to church on Sunday too. Um, are there a few questions that we have? Um, let's see. Um, if you are able to get closer to the end of a row. Or that just shout it out. We're black. Yeah. <laughs> we've, so got, we do. we've got vocal, like, it's, we project. All right. So we got one over here to my, to my right. Yeah. So if you stand up, please, and tell us your name so that, so that they can. 
Good see evening. You. I'm Brad Johnson with PEG Music here in Nashville. Good nice evening. to meet you, Brad. Thank you. Could you take us back to the moment when you decided that it was time to found and create Uncle Nearest? <laughs> I, I wish I could say that there was a moment <laughs> where it was just sort of time. This has been a journey of simply following the paths that light up and not saying no along the way, even if we didn't know how we were going to do it. I'll give you a very good example. We came to Lynchburg, Tennessee for my 40th birthday. I decided what I wanted to do was research this story, was to dive deeper. And I looked at this as, again, the story in the press at that time was incredibly negative. I had come to the conclusion that it was actually a story of love, honor, and respect. And I had decided that if I was right, it was a story that was going to give people hope, that I, I did want to get that out into the world. And so we came down here. He gave me four days. He was not happy about coming to a town called Lynchburg. I can it's tell you a, that. If, if it were my birthday, you guys would not know Uncle Nearest. There would be, uh, you would know sand and beach. It would be tiki drinks and something else. And so he didn't want to come. He said, you got four days. Get in there, get whatever research you can, and then we are, we're going home. And you're not going back to Lynchburg without me. And so you're going to have to do whatever other research from L.A. We're there not but a couple of hours. We're sitting in the library, and, and uh, the eldest living descendant of Jack Daniels walks through the door. Now, her, her mother was alive at that time, so she was the second eldest, but now she is the, the eldest descendant of Jack Daniels. And I'll skip through all the conversation and all the rest of that stuff. But before she left, she said, hey, you know that book that you read referring to Jack Daniels' legacy? She said, the majority of what happened in that book was on the Dan Call Farm, which I, I did know that. We now know that it's where the original distillery number seven was, and it's where Jack grew up and all the rest of that. She said, you realize that farm is for sale? 313 acres of pure American history. It is now a designated historic, it's on the, it will be on the historical registry, right? They're, they're printing the plaque and all that now. But the house had sat on the market for 15 months. How's that even possible? It makes no sense whatsoever, right? And so take that one story, and then Keith and I, we walk into the house. We look at each other. We know immediately we are going to buy this house. However, we had just invested in some founders that made poor decisions is an understatement. We had literally just lost about $2 million dollars. So what we did not have is the million dollars for this farm. We put in the offer anyway, and we said we'll take it all cash. We didn't even have enough for the deposit, if it was a typical deposit. But then after we said it and we looked at each other, we said, we don't know how we're going to do this, but I guess we'll figure it out by the time the deposit's due in you know, a week or whatever it was. And so our realtor calls us and says, okay, this is the deposit amount. It was 1%. Who's ever had a 1% deposit? <laughs> and then she said, because they're older and they need extra time to get out of the house, do you mind a four-month escrow? Wow. So take that, multiply that 20 times. That's how many times things like that at least have happened along this journey. So there was never a definitive this is what we're going to do. It was more every single time a path, it just lights up, we're going to take it. Our lives are a little bit like driving in the fog. God only allows us to see so far ahead, and we're content with that. And so we just assume that whatever is on the other side of the light that we can't see, that the answer is already there. And so we have just simply continued on without ever saying no. So what you see, Uncle Nears, all the accolades, it is, it is hands down, well, Nears Green Distillery is the largest black-owned distillery in America. It may be in the world. We just haven't checked outside of it. But it is absolutely the most successful of any type of spirit that has ever been led by a non-white male. 
It's all right. Yes, sir. Good evening. Most importantly, thank you for being here to share your story and your journey. Uh, I'm Clint Story with Citizens Bank, and our bank is very proud to be the oldest African-American yes. bank in the country. Yes. And we're based right here in Nashville, Tennessee. By we, Fisk. Absolutely. Yeah. Fisk TSU Mary right there. Yes. And we've always been very proud to uh, financially educate and empower our people. And I know that something that's very important to you all is the Black Business Booster Program, mm. where you are providing distribution, capital, and branding for African-American-owned spirits companies. So please talk more about that, if you don't mind. Sure. So we've got, uh, you've conflated two different things, but most people do. We have two different uh, programs. Actually, we have three. Uh, when we became so successful and I learned how we were, there were so many firsts, I was a tad bit concerned that it's 2022 and we had this many firsts. Like a year into business and it was like, you're the first, you're the first, you're the first. And how is that even possible? And so... I wanted to make sure that, yes, we're the first, but I don't want it to be that far behind us that the next one is coming. And so there's three different things that we do. The Black Business Booster Program is simply, if you are black owned in the spirits business and it's your full-time job, we're not, I don't have time for anybody's side hustle, but if you are black owned in the spirits business and it is your full-time job, you have the utilization of our team. Period. No questions asked. We're not invested. We're not. It is simply you need distributors. We're going to put you with the, the heads of them. You need whatever it is. And so almost every single black owned spirit brand that is out there that is doing well that you all know about. If you ask them about the black business booster program, they're likely in it. We just don't promote that. Uh, that but that's that's the one thing. Then the second thing is we have Uncle Nearest Ventures, which I think you were also referring to, which is we invest in businesses that are BIPOC founded, owned, and led. And so BIPOC or female, although every, everyone that we've invested in so far has been black owned, and it's minimum investment of $2 million. The highest that we've done so far is $4 million. We've now invested in four brands. We're about to invest in the fifth. And the idea is we have already figured out how to do this as independents in this industry. We are not selling. This is being passed to the next generation. So we're looking for other uh, brands that have that same ability, that legacy type of thing, those legs. Those are the ones that we will invest in. And I ask them flat out when they come to me, are you passing this to the next generation? Or are you looking to make money? And everyone who has said that they're looking to make money, I've not invested in. So that's the second one. The third one is the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative is realizing that there were so few people at the top that are black in the spirits industry. We had to figure out how to not have a crockpot version of how to get people there. We needed to have a microwave version of how to put to get people there. So our leadership apprentice program, you come into it and you identify where you want to be on the other side, head of a distillery, master distiller, master blender, whatever it is. And in that 18 months, both the Jack Daniel family and our family work side by side in these apprenticeships. And you've never seen anything like it because there's never been anything like it. But within 18 months, they're in that top position. And that is what we're doing across this country. And there's a bunch of other stuff under the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative, but those are the three things I think you're mainly talking about. Outstanding. Anybody I'm trying to go side to side? I don't see anybody over here. So yes, sit, just shout, shout it out if there's not a microphone nearby, and then I'll come back over here. Hello. 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 Yes. Hi, Sania. Sania? Sania. Sania.
to be a boss so no one takes it seriously. And what method did you use building your brand as yeah. a boss woman to surpass those extreme blockages? So I'm going to take that. You had about 24 questions there. <laughs> And and so I'm gonna I'm gonna, gonna take a I'm gonna take a few of them. The hubs will take a few of them because he's he has done this in the construct of of actually having people over him, right? Where he he knows more than they do, and and I came out the gate swinging. So I've never really had anybody that. So we'll 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 break this up, right? For two different parts of your life. In in terms of of. I'm not even going to address your question. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you something that's more helpful than your question was. Is that okay? Okay. There, if you go to YouTube and simply put in scientist fleas in a jar, you are going to get an old black and white video that I highly recommend you watch that is not even two minutes. Has anyone ever seen this? I love when I'm in a room in which people have never seen this. This experiment was done. I don't even know when it was. I think it may have been in the 60s. But this experiment was done where scientists literally put fleas in a jar. And if anyone that has ever seen a flea, they boing, they just bounce, right? They just keep going up. They put a lid on top of the jar so that the fleas, every single time it hit it hit the top of the jar. So after three days, those fleas stopped actually going to the lid. They would stop right below the lid to make sure that they did not hit this ceiling, if you will. After three days, they took the lid off. The fleas never went above that level. But what's more important for what I believe you're probably dealing with is neither did their offspring. So when I look at what most women and most people of color that I have come into contact with, what they are really dealing with is they actually think that lid is still on. If I'm nothing else, I'm proof that lid has been off And if you would just believe it's off and just go and not look at the limitations, you can do patriarchal. I'm in the whitest, most male industry ever. You go into any liquor store, any restaurant, more than 90% of the sales in this industry are six spirit conglomerates, all founded by, owned by, led by white males. Over 90% of the sales and then there's me. I'm the flea who did not think there was a lid. I'm, hell no, I'm not following that. No, no, oh hell no, no. So what I was gonna say was, um, well, I was fixing to tell you some, no. Sometimes you have to just know, that was a period, that was. All right, we're going to take one more question before we... Somebody over here? Thank you, thank you. This will be brief, so I'll... <laughs> but first of all, Keith and Fawn, really, we're just... Thank you for exhibiting what it takes for, you know, as a couple, collaborates and, and moves forward. So, again, thank you for really exhibiting that, and thanks for, you know, first of all, coming out tonight. Um, I know, wife and I, we, we've been married for 33 years now, so I understand. Uh, so, again... See, it's fun. You know, Keith. This, well, she embarrasses you. I like to embarrass her. So oh, there you nice. go. <laughs> but um, again, thank you so much. And really, anyone who hasn't been, you have to go. We went earlier in the year to Uncle Nearest earlier, and then had friends and family that came in town, and we made sure we took them. So uh, again, put that out there, and actually have a bottle of the uh, was it the uh, Master Blend Number Eight Batch yeah. at home. So. For special occasions, so yeah. okay, good. So really, like Fridays, exactly, yeah. exactly, <laughs> <laughs> like any day. But again, just thank you on that. And then when we went through the presentation, one thing that hit me, of course, Fawn talks about her background in PR, and just curious on what your, what it was as far as the marketing side, just with Mr. Wright, Jeffrey Wright, doing that narration. Just, I mean, it just oh, yeah. with the perfect 
you know, intro, tell that story. So I was just curious on how that came about. Have, have, have most of the people in here, do, they, do you know what he's referring to, the story yeah. of Nearest Green? Yes, okay. If you've not seen it, you can go to nearestgreen.com, N-E-A-R-E-S-T.com. You'll see the film there. So the background of the story with Jeffrey Wright was, was really simple. His people had been trying to reach me for a while because he wanted to invest in the company. And I'm not easy to reach if... I'm not sure it's going to be HBU, highest and best use of my time. I don't care who you are. And so by the time his people finally said uh, what it was that he was looking for, which was to invest in the company, I took the call. And I let him know I'm not doing a raise. We had just done, I think, the Series A. And I said, I'm not doing another raise. But when we do do a Series B, you'll be my first phone call. And he said, okay, but because everywhere I go, bars, restaurants, no matter where I am, I'm making sure I share the story of Nearest Green. And so can you, will you at least let me amplify the story? And so that is where that film came from was Jeffrey simply wanting to amplify the story. We've never, we're not a celebrity brand. We've never had a celebrity back it. Uh, But this was literally just him wanting to help us to tell the story. And and I think he did a brilliant job. And now he is an investor, uh, but he did a brilliant job, I think. Oh, talk about building this muscle. This is going back to, I I want to, Sainia. Sinea. In terms of building the muscle, what workout do you normally do? Whenever you work out. It could be a year ago. Squats. Is that comfortable? Is it building muscle? The only way you build muscle is you get uncomfortable. And the 12 weeks of Christmas, everybody thinks we've been planning that for a year because it was a brilliant marketing thing. (laughs) Brilliant. 45 minutes, I was trying to solve a problem. I got a phone call from our CBO. There was an issue with our rye labels that the TTB was trying to apply something to us that they had never applied to anyone else. They've since retracted that. Uh, But in that moment, I knew we were going to miss the deadline of the rye release, which is what we had planned and what we said we were going to do. And so I sat there on the phone with her, and she's panicked. And I said, calm down. Give me a second. And while on the phone with her, he had just mentioned something to me about 12 days of Christmas. And so what immediately popped in my head was that. But obviously, we're too far away from to do anything that was 12 days of Christmas. And so I said, hold on. And I pulled up my calendar, and I began to count them out week-wise. 12 weeks. I said, 12 weeks of Christmas. This is what we're going to do. And literally in 45 minutes on that call, we laid out what everybody is currently going crazy about because I flex my muscles that I've built. Y'all thank our, give our guests a round of applause. Y'all give it up for them one more time. It has been a uh, tremendous honor to have Keith and Fawn Weaver with us tonight. Uh, Please join us outside for a a small cocktail reception. We'll have a little Uncle Nearest and continue the celebration. Thank you all so much for coming. Give it up for one more time.